you've probably never heard of one of Space Station 13's oldest and most popular servers. You won't ever find it on the server hub, and these days, you're likely only going to gain access if you're lucky enough to know a longtime player. With a deeply dedicated fanbase and slavish devotion from its sole developer, LifeWeb offers a deeply immersive experience unlike any other. Heavily inspired by classic media like Baldur's Gate, War Fortress, and A Song of Ice and Fire, LifeWeb focused heavily on immersive roleplay. The game takes place on the planet of Evergreen, deep underground in a fortress which has technologically regressed in many ways to a medieval setting, after spending ages under a recently fallen force field that protected it from the horrors roaming outer space. Where LifeWeb differs from your typical server is in its fantastic dedication to atmosphere. You would be hard pressed to find any action in the game that does not feature excellent sound design paired with gorgeous art design. With its hands-off moderation, the community is free to tell the story as they will it. No two rounds are ever the same, and it's no surprise why you can regularly find players who have several thousand rounds played, even though you only find the game up on weekends. I've heard it said that roleplay is used to enhance the mechanics of Space Station 13, but in LifeWeb, the mechanics serve to enhance the roleplay. Time to stop gushing and get into the history. Our story begins sometime in late 2011. A longtime space station player by the beyond key of Randy Sandy began to notice some disturbing changes in the direction of the game. The old roleplay focused community who had come to love the game for its immersive sessions and parody of sci-fi classics had slowly begun to be replaced with players wanting a different experience. The game began to turn into something more akin to Second Life, with the focus moving more towards silly additions and strict moderation than a focus on deepening immersive roleplay. Coincidentally, the team behind Bay 12 Luna had made their code open source and merged with TG. Already with a solid foundation and joined by the more roleplay-minded members of the Russian community, Randy continued the development of Luna, first creating a new, smaller, more atmospheric map titled NSV Magellan, tweaking the traditional SS-13 lore and instead placing the world within the System Shock universe, advertising his new server on the SS-13 RU forums as Euphoria 12. Most of the first comments are calling out bugs, complaining about the lack of stuff to do, or suggesting design changes, but the seed of what would become LifeWeb was planted. By December of 2011, Euphoria had gone offline. The threat archived and Randy disappeared for a time, reappearing again in early 2012 to release Space Station V, or 5. Featuring a number of bug fixes and a brand new prison station, this release would be taken more favorably. The lore again develops further, featuring a company called Trinet, a likely reference to System Shock's Trioptimum Corporation. There wasn't a terribly deep gameplay loop yet, but the creative community began to tell tales of a secret cult within the prison, the Thanati. One particular round featured an old, crazed hag, driven crazy by the dark whispers that reverberated through the prison walls. She collected blood, body parts, and garbage from around the station for some twisted dark ritual. Before she could finish her spell, the other prisoners rose up and slew her. The incredible story of this round would go on to deeply inspire LifeWeb's Thanati cult as we know it today. This iteration would last for the rest of 2012 as Randy continued to tinker away and mold Luna into his own personal codebase. In 2013, the game would take a major leap with the release of Space Station November, this time taking place on the Royal Mining Station November, which hovered above the planet Evergreen, behind the still-standing shield which protected the planet. In service of a planetary tribunal, the station existed to mine and process plasma to be shipped to the surface to continue to power the shield. On board the station were a host of characters, the Meister, or Master of the station, the nobility to lord over the workers, tribunal guards to enforce the law, and of course the miners and support staff that enabled them to do their work. Of course nothing ever went according to plan. With no real rules, players were free to drive the story of every round. If the miners felt mistreated, they often overthrew the lazy nobility and rebelled against the tribunal guards. They would plot their revolution in a dingy murky bar, or in the narrow hallways of the station away from the watchful eyes of the guards. In such a cramped environment, it often did not take long for conflict to brew, which eventually would boil over into large brawls. Combat here worked differently than your average SS-13 server. There was a much greater focus on melee combat featuring both sword and spear. Greatly expanding on Bay's already complex medical system, Randy worked alongside partners Logius and Slewpoke to develop a labyrinthian medical system, complemented by an incredibly deep melee combat that made fighting one of the most fun things to do. Never a dull moment, the station would often be assailed by outside forces such as zombies, zombies, aliens, or on occasion a cult of heretics known as the Thanati. To battle this cult, the station was also staffed by an inquisitor and his faithful servants, literally invisible children, who could spy and report back to their master. There were a number of custom donation rules around this time, such as an elder vampire or a trinet intersecure that would crush rebellion in the station. For about six months, the Russian community would weave thorough tales about the November and especially about the planet below that it served. Around this time, long-running dark fantasy series such as A Song of Ice and Fire, First Law, and Planescape began to re-enter the public zeitgeist. 
lover of grimdark fantasy and urban horror series like The World of Darkness, Randy toiled to move the game from space to the surface of Evergreen, taking with him the influence of these series alongside the living story crafted by the players of November, Space Station 5, and Euphoria. Initially playtested by a small circle of friends, Randy would announce to the SS-13 Rue forums that he was to release his next game, LifeWeb, on the 13th of June, 2013. The inspiration for the name would come from several places. The MS DOS game DreamWeb, the web of lies and politicking that players would weave throughout a round, and most importantly, the Arcanos LifeWeb from Wraith the Oblivion. The Wraiths who followed the LifeWeb monitored life itself, turning its energy into their own. In an ordinary SS-13 server, power is provided by a Tesla coil, an engine, or some kind of solar panel. Here, the fortress would be powered by the LifeWeb, a contraption that converted blood to electricity. If the fort was to have power, someone would have to die. The lifeweb is operated by the faithful morticians, who plug sacrifices into the machine for the sake of the fortress, as well as ensure the dead are buried. As the planetary shield around Evergreen fell, raiding parties of slavers descended upon the planet, leading to paranoia, war, and famine throughout. The players find themselves as residents of the fortress Ravenheart, or desperate migrants fleeing their homes in search of safety. Within the fortress, a series of social dynamics play out. Ruling over the fortress is the Baron and his family. Here, his word is law. His will was carried out by his fierce Cerberi, led by the mighty Censor. Within Ravenheart, the nobility and the wealthy live with great comfort, waited on hand and foot by the lowly servants who call the fort home. There is, however, a third element with some power within the fort, the Church. Led by the Bishop and patrolled by the Inquisition, even the Baron has to fear ending up on the wrong side of an accusation. This triangle of forces, the nobility, the peasants, and the Church, all create dynamic and complex series of stories and interactions. The Baron can only push as hard as his hounds can enforce. The church can rein in the Baron, but only if they can actually reach him. And the people, well, a drop of poison in the right glass can right any past wrongs. This intriguing political web was backed by truly innovative mechanics that made the game feel more immersive than anything before it. This would be the first chance the community at large would have to experience this new project, and to many, it would be a breath of fresh air. As SS-13 became more regulated, LifeWeb's sole rule of respect the game was a complete pivot from what the game had become. Combat had weight, the horrors of the medical system were many, excellent sound design paired with Quake and Planescape Torment inspired color palette left players mired in the darkness of this world. Randy would continue to develop the game for the remainder of 2013, allowing only his inner circle to test the game. Throughout 2014 and into January of 2015, the game would remain exclusive to the Russian community. Both records and videos from this period of the game are fairly rare. There exist a few videos of early gameplay and many Russian players fondly remember a map called Vernovo, or Raventown, but many of the details are lost to time. One consistent theme is that the maps were often bunkers or fallout shelters for the cowering residents of Evergreen. By watching some of this footage, you can tell that the game in many ways was still very much Space Station 13. There are a lot of leftover sprites, movement is quite similar, and much of the layout feels like that of your typical SS-13 hallway when compared to the more modern city maps we have today. Even back then, the sensor still stands by while the Baron is murdered. Most players at this point found the game through the SS13.ru forums or through word of mouth and began to congregate themselves onto LifeWeb's own forums, which became quite the interesting place. Throughout the year, the game worked out a lot of its earlier kinks, and the combat system continued to deepen. According to Randy, the melee combat file is a whopping 700 kilobytes. For reference, every single species file in modern TG does not even add up to that amount. While I have not seen the file itself, there are likely thousands of lines of code handling every possible intricate detail played out during combat. It was on February 13th, 2015 that we came upon arguably the most pivotal moment in the history of LifeWeb, the announcement and the release of an English version of the game. For the past year, the Western community had only heard whispers or seen screenshots of this occult Russian walled garden and now they too could enter. This move was viewed by Randy as a big risk initially. He didn't speak English well yet, and he had thousands of items to translate. Not only that, but the Western SS-13 community had never experienced a game like this before, and it was quite different from the direction the most popular servers were going at the time. Nevertheless, it worked. The Western population exploded as word spread across various forums, boards, and they too began to join on the early Interzone LifeWeb forums. It would be this Western player base who began to rigorously track the various changes and maps played. The first map Interzone would play never quite reached consensus on a name, but I'm going to go ahead and call it the Drowned Village. 
releasing and running for around two months. This map would set the tone for the rest of the game's history as punishing, intricate, and innovative. Baron's Keep would be located south of a sprawling network of caves, separated from the village by a large moat and narrow bridge. This moat would quickly become a mass grave for the player base as they collectively learned that they did not know how to swim. Not only were the peasants drowning in the waters, but the keep featured a private swimming pool for nobility that the Baron could often be found floating lifelessly in. He too realized that he did not know how to swim. The very first rounds ever played on Interzone featured Randy and Sloopoke, hulked out on the bridge tossing hapless peasants into the waters below. Randy also began to show off one of LifeWeb's unique features, multi-Z level sight lines and interactions. You could shoot arrows down at players from rooftops or balconies, something completely inconceivable at first. Many players throughout the game thought that it was bugged, until they were able to try it out for themselves. The immense depth of the game led to players grouping together and building out intricate meta sheets in order to record the many mechanics available to them, treating each new discovery as a small advantage they could keep to themselves and their friends. The village on the other side of the moat was a stretch of decayed buildings, running from east to west. Primary building, of course, being the brothel a giant, wooden, multi-storied building with a bar, places to chat, and swimming pools that were often littered with drowned bodies, a recurring theme, hence the Drowned Village. Hidden throughout the village were prophecies of angels and other great figures throughout the lore. These prophecies also warned of the fallen angels who rejected the Lord and instead set about to deceive humans, binding them into infernal contracts. Randy used Patreon to fund development of these many references and turned them into proper antagonist roles, releasing them when the game reached various levels of funding. Some of the earliest rewards were the fallen and their counter, the PEU, a secretive organization determined to summon a faithful angel and learn the true name of the demon, thus banishing it back to hell. It's quite clear to me that a lot of these religious elements of the early game were derived from White Wolf's demon the Fallen. To the north of the village was an absolute labyrinth of caves, filled to the brim with traps, holes to fall into, and desperate migrants navigating the dark. In the original planning of the game, these caves would not be inhabited by migrants, but instead by two teams of pig-masked men poisoned and forced to fight for the entertainment of the Baron, the winner receiving an antidote and access to the fortress. This idea, however, was scrapped in favor of the migrants as we know them today. All throughout the map were one-by-one -one holes that would drop you into a piss-colored puddle to drown in. It wouldn't be uncommon for a third of the round to manage to get themselves killed in this manner. It wasn't really hard to do either. The map was dark. Identifying dangers is quite difficult, especially without the knowledge players have now. In today's game, migrants would spawn apart in randomized locations, but at this time, they all spawned together in the same spot. This led to massive waves of migrants, or instant brawls. It wasn't uncommon for players to be set upon before they could even stand up, filling the OOC chat with how to stand on a regular basis. Any spirit unfortunate enough to die within the caves would return to life a screamer, which is more or less a zombie, now shambling about the caves looking to infect and consume any other unlucky enough to cross its path. For a short period of time, there was also an antagonist role called the Puppeteer, who could control the monsters in the cave known as Skinless, like an RTS game. It was scrapped eventually when pathfinding became a bit too laggy to be feasible. Those who died in the safety of the village or fort were met with an equally wicked fate. They could return to haunt the world as a wraith, harvesting the angst of the dead and dying that they could use to interact with the living world. These wraiths could go as far as possessing other players, luring monsters to them, and generally spooking the hell out of the living. Even in their ghostly forms, the residents of Evergreen were not safe. Spectres, or servants of oblivion, roamed the afterlife looking for spirits to toss into a never-ending maze. If that wasn't bad enough, each round at the very start, a team of players would join as soul breakers, or intergalactic Islamic slavers who raid the planet in search of new merchandise. But not even death is a reprieve, and life is a constant torment. LifeWeb earned its reputation as a server only for those who enjoyed the suffering. Our next map, sometimes titled Venice or Map 2, would be released sometime in mid-March 2015. This map would be a proper city grid layout, and would feature a train station in which all the late joining members of the fort would arrive. This train station could be remembered for having an absolutely gigantic chessboard. Migrants would still be relegated to spawning in groups, which remain just as deadly. The Pusher, a dealer of black market goods, would find his new hideout safely tucked away behind a statue, hidden from the prying eyes that would hope to intrude on his dealings. For many, this map would be seen as a major improvement from Map 1. It was more organized, the layout made more sense, and it helped foster a deeper roleplay. Many, however, took issue with the new brothel. It was tiny, wooden, and always on fire. This was a bit of a step down for the mansion of Map 1. This refined layout did a much better job at luring in new players, giving them a slightly better chance of surviving the round from time to time. One of the biggest additions to this map was a proper graveyard. Now morticians were expected to bury the dead in proper graves, both to help them respawn and to prevent anything untoward from happening to the corpses, though this often had the opposite effect. The graveyard often became the meeting point for any local members of the Thanati cult, 
who required body parts to summon their lord. The more condensed layout also allowed for more cunning antagonists to terrify the residents. As the game's popularity grew, so too did the Patreon donations, unlocking more antagonists such as werewolves who could be seen battling it out in the streets with vampires, or stalking the alleys for prey. A changeling-like monster only known as Mother, or They, that could sometimes be found scurrying in the shadows, absorbing the essence of any bum too drunk or too stupid to avoid the dark. If Mother consumed enough, her true horrific form would be revealed to the masses. In the brothels, you could often find your amuser to be a succubus or incubus, taking their payment in the form of your very soul. Though the layout of the map may have been more orderly, its residents were anything but. It didn't take long to realize that a sizable portion of the player base was not the right fit for the server. At the end of May 2015, Randy would change his name to Theo and begin his purge of the player base known as Garbage Day. I've seen various estimates of the culling. Somewhere between 30-50% to 50 of the player base was banned, either permanently or forced to reapply and recommit them themselves to maintaining the spirit of the game. Throughout the history of the game, there's been a number of ban waves which have helped trim the fat from the community, but none ever came close to the original Garbage Day. While this put the fear of God into some of the less serious players, that eventually subsided, leading to Sundays becoming known as the Sunday Club on Server 1. This meant that only players with the OOC rank of Villain could join the main game in an attempt to keep roleplay levels high. At the time, to become a villain you had to apply on the forums, and get the backing of other players or catch the eye of staff somehow. This worked somewhat it often led to players who were more popular or had meta groups to support them being the only ones allowed to play on S1 during the Sundays. Though the level of roleplay certainly did improve. Following Map 2, there were two short lived bunker themed maps that were both generally greatly disliked. They were incredibly small, players were cramped together, and unable to even have a moment of privacy. The first iteration of the bunker we'll call 2.25. It lasted a grand total of one weekend before going back in the oven. Bunker 2.5 would release shortly and be equally disliked for similar reasons, but with the addition of having one of the most deadly elevators in the history of the game. Map 2.5 would only itself last a few weeks before mercifully being replaced with what many would consider the first name map of the game, Lowtown, in the fall of 2015. Lowtown again was incredibly innovative, and marked a period where the game began to grow rather exponentially. As for the map itself, it would feature two towns, separated by a large elevator. In the Lowtown, as it was called, the village was run by the incredibly strong sheriff who kept a law on the dingy and poorly lit streets. Up above, in Hightown, the nobility and wealthy enjoyed clean, well-kept homes and apartments with abundant food and security provided by the Baron Cerberi. The caves, of course, connected to Lowtown, sometimes even extending a Z-level or two above the walkways, leading to many hilarious incidents of screamers launching themselves from cliffs onto often unsuspecting residents. Being a good sheriff was a mark of honor at this point. If you could keep order in Lowtown, you quickly earn the respect of the player base, and many players first cut their teeth rounding up monsters, criminals, and ne'er-do-wells who bothered Lowtown. If all the usual horrors weren't bad enough, Lowtown was absolutely filled to the brim with giant rats that wasted no time in murdering those dumb enough to wander near. One of the most notable things about this map is it would be the first map to introduce Lifeweb's best known antagonist, the Dreamer. The Dreamer more or less acts as a deranged serial killer who creates horrifying structures out of corpses. Anyone who witnesses his art is likely to be his next victim, as the Dreamer attacks them, carves out their heart, and searches them for an answer. Once the Dreamer unlocks the completed answer, he wakes up aboard a space station revealing the whole thing to have been nothing more than a nightmare. Innerzen's first dreamer would awaken November 22nd, 2015. The antagonist is almost certainly inspired by the book A Maze of Death by Philip K. Dick, which features a very similar plotline. One mechanic I have neglected to mention thus far is the mood system. Generally, if you take care of yourself, fulfill your vices, and eat well, your character will be happy. Around the middle of Lowtown's run, Randy added specialized curses to the game, such as Gamiza. When another character hears you call them this, their mood immediately tanks. If your mood goes low enough, you can even die. This led to what we'll call the Gamiza Incident. During a siege round, a good chunk of the player base were closely bunched together upon spawning in. One bold player immediately began spamming Gamiza, shook into their very core. Everyone began violently puking and shitting themselves to death, ending the round almost as soon as it began. Events like this were not rare. The opening of Innerzoon brought with it a ton of chaos. Many players were less focused on the roleplay and more focused on the fragging. This caused some clashes within the community as players who wanted a high roleplay experience ran up against those just trying to bomb the church as fast as possible. In an attempt to cut this down, sometime around map 3 the chromosome system was introduced. This was a persistent currency system that would follow players from round to round and encourage good play. Chromosomes could be spent on things like changing the round type, respawning, launching the Karen, otherwise known as the escape shuttle. These are all pretty good incentives to succeed in your role. However, 
However, other players can also take chromosomes away from you, namely the Inquisition. Through various methods of torture, the Inquisitor can remove not only your skin, but your precious chromies. This made the player actually care about getting tortured and not just instantly disconnect. You couldn't just GG go next and joke around, unless you wanted your hard work to go up in flames. Winning a round as an anti can sometimes reward between 2-5 to five chromosomes, and in a single session the Inquisitor can purge you of 30 or so if you don't cooperate. While chromies did often add to the experience, they weren't the end-all be-all of driving behavior. If that wasn't enough of a shakeup, Map 3 would also see the end of the forums. The LifeWeb forums would go down around December of 2015. It's rumored on Reddit and often repeated that the reason was illegal content being posted. This isn't the truth. According to Hydrated, Randy just forgot to pay the subscription fee and there were some technical difficulties piling up behind the scenes. There was no FSB raid or drone strike on the LifeWeb servers. This closure would lead to Hydrated creating the Hideout Discord and becoming the community manager, allowing Randy to take a backseat away from the community and focus solely on improving the quality of the game. All in all, the Ruzone forums would last about a year and a half, with their inner zone counterpart lasting about 10 months. In some ways, Randy viewed this closure as a positive event, as the forums were becoming mostly shitposts. The next map, often referred to as City, released around May of 2016, would be yet another pivotal moment in the history of the game, often going down as a community favorite. City would be one of the most compact maps yet. In many ways, it was gigantic, with a town surrounded by a river, a train station and a mercenary guild to the west, a village connecting to the caves to the east, and of course the Barrens Keep to the very north. This map would also feature a rather large graveyard that also doubled as a farm on an island to the northwest. A layer of sewers ran underneath the town as well as a rooftop layer that made this tightly woven city actually feel much larger than it appeared on the surface. This map added the ambush feature to the game in which certain tiles would run across, would spawn an immediate danger of some kind. This new feature again adds to the casualty rate within Ravenheart. This map would also be the last to contain the secret ninja garb, often located on top of Sanctuary. This ninja garb featured pants with seven pockets and boots that removed fall damage. It would also be the last of the map to feature the PEU slash Fallen Angel game mode, thus severing Demon the Fallen connection. City would remain the primary map for some time as major content was worked on behind the scenes. Not only was Randy busy working on a fifth map, but he's nearly finished with an almost complete overhaul game mode known as Orbital Station 13, first releasing to Inner Zone in December of 2016. OS 13 puts the game back into space with heavy alien and system shock overtones. The crew awakens from a cryo sleep to an emergency which they must solve. This game mode offers a deeper look into some of the greater lore outside of the world of Evergreen, and features a number of jobs your typical SS 13 player would be more familiar with, like Captain, Medical, Engineer, and Logistics. It also features unique jobs, such as a cyber technician who is tasked with hacking various systems throughout the round to restore access to the crew, the pilot who can explore nearby systems in his ship, and arguably the most important, the Psycon. The Psionic Counselor is the most important member, as they are able to use their psychic powers to awaken clones, teach other crew members skills, and read minds to suss out any traitors or possible dangers to the crew. OS 13 by itself could be a popular server, merging the deep complexity of LifeWeb with an undercurrent of Joseph Conrad's Nostromo. The fact that it is used as an occasional shakeup round only goes to further the massive achievement that LifeWeb has become. Randy has said himself that he views the release of OS 13 as the completion point for LifeWeb, while well, further maps and balancing tweaks of course came after. OS 13 is the last major planned update to the game at this time. Following City and the release of OS 13, we are greeted by Map 5 around February of 2017, which would be yet another elevator-focused map. In many ways, an extension of Lowtown. This map would see the elevator placed in the center of the fort and used to connect the various sea levels together. This elevator, like many before it, would serve as a killing machine for new players and those who suffer from unfortunately timed lag. The primary difference between this map and Lowtown was the fact that you had important buildings on various levels, whereas Lowtown just kind of shoved everything important up above and put all the horrors below. This map would also mark the period in which just about every recycled SS-13 sprite had been removed from the game. LifeWeb's visual style had come completely into its own, and with every small update, the game was becoming more and more of a joy to look at. The UI would also receive a number of small updates to condense things, such as the removal of the save verb and easier hotkeying. One of the most confusing but also creative things about this iteration of Elevator was the fact that almost every building had five floors. This often meant the echoing of noises to floors below, which only added to the horrors of the rounds, because you could never be too sure how far from danger you really were. This more vertical design sometimes led to the map feeling a bit cramped when compared to the more sprawling maps of old. A very good chunk of the player base will remember Elevator as probably the second longest running map of all time, going for around nine months. 
addition to working on the next map, often referred to as Golden River, which were released in November of 2017, Randy would release the rotation system, allowing maps to change between rounds and weekends. This greatly shook up the game and kept things from getting stale, but also added some controversy as the so-called better maps were sometimes not played as often as the community would like. From this point on, I'll be a bit more concise with the descriptions of the maps. I'm going to do my best to describe them on launch as everything from this point has had massive amounts of changes and tweaks along the way, some radically altering the flow of the maps. Not only that, but you can log in and still play them today if you get lucky enough with the rotation. Map 6, or Golden River, would be a return to form for the game. Almost in the style of Map 1, Golden River would be an expansive map which sprawled from east to west, aptly named Golden River due to the flowing yellow river that ran through the village and fortress. It would also often be referred to as the Rot Hold, as much of the fort would be covered in poisonous explosive rot that loved nothing more than to destroy the lungs of any unlucky passerby. In addition to this large amount of rot, Golden River would also be the first map with the Geshef, a local businessman and factory owner that had connections to the communities outside the fort. The Geshef would become a large source of the fort's income by exporting goods and bringing back in obols for the Baron to waste. In its original state, this map was incredibly cramped. Sanctuary Church and the Inn were right next to each other to the east, while the newly minted Geshef was just south of that. This led to some dislike initially before the map was further developed. Due to the rotation system, maps came out at a much slower pace. Older maps were often fixed up alongside any tweaks needed to Golden River. Alongside this, Randy finished a massive UI update in the spring of 2018, revamping the sidebar to the one we all know today. It would not be until January 5th, 2019 that we would have our seventh map, titled Lonesome Streets, originally nicknamed Biscuit. Where Golden River resembled Map 1, Lonesome Streets' inspiration clearly came from that of Map 4, City. While the map retained its verticality by adding roofs, balconies, and other vantage points, it earned its namesake by having long, winding streets to get lost in. These streets, of course, would be littered with danger and players skulking above, waiting to pounce on unsuspecting victims. While the sanctuary was a bit of a cramped nightmare, one of the coolest additions to the map was the Underfort, a labyrinthian system of winding tunnels and hideaways that players could call home. A common occurrence on this map was unsuspecting smurds digging a bit too far east and flooding the entirety of the lower levels. In many ways, this map was an improvement on its predecessor. Another major change came to the community around this time as well, the Comrade system. Much like the villain system from the forums, trusted players would be selected and given the role of Comrade. Comrades would be able to play more complicated roles like the Baron, Inquisitor, or Incarn. In addition to in-game bonuses, they would also have the privilege of inviting new players to the game. This would also coincide with the removal of somewhat popular game mode, Wanderlust, in which the fortress would be tasked with retrieving a prisoner from a far-off jail located deep within the caves. These rounds would often go on for hours, as the expedition died during their journey, leaving the prison to devolve into chaos and degeneracy while the fort almost never fared any better. Following Lonesome Streets, in November of 2019, we would receive our eighth map, titled Hungry Burrows. This map was unfortunately a bit of a disaster. It was way too dark while simultaneously being way too easy to navigate. Players could simply walk north in the caves and reach the fort with ease. They could also just hop into the river and assuming they can swim, they'd be able to float up onto the merchant's docks and cause chaos there. This led to migrants busting in the gates about 10 minutes into every round and the fort would quickly devolve into chaos. The map was also littered with traps. In a callback to the old days, somewhere around a third of the players would quickly be dead to various pitfalls, traps, and ambushes. In a lot of ways, the map just felt like a smaller, less grand version of Map 7. I personally loved the church on this map. It had a very cozy little prayer room that often and gave a quiet respite from whatever craziness was going on outside. Not only that, but it had a fun little field where peasants could entertain the nobility by pelting each other with rocks. This would be the only map in the modern era of life up to be removed from the game due to its inherent problems. For a good long while, the game would rotate between map 6, 7, and 8 until December of 2021, we would be greeted with the game's penultimate map, Fragile Bridges. Throughout 2019 and 2020, the game would again grow in size as more and more of the comrades were added to the game and each began to invite a slew of their own friends. This led to many bands, but also many new quality members who began to contribute in their own ways. Just before the release of Fragile Bridges, Randy would announce he had begun work on the sequel to LifeWeb, known as Scorcher. Scorcher would be another heavily immersive roleplay focused game that gave us a closer look into the slave planet of Isfet. The player base, rejuvenated by news of both a new map and the possibility of a new game, flocked to Fragile Bridges, which in many ways would be a callback to Map 1, with the fort located in the southern tip of the map instead of the north. Fragile Bridges referred to the winding interconnected bridges that would piece together the various shops and districts of the fort. 
The bridges themselves were often many sea levels up and over roaring rivers that would quickly consume any dumb enough or unfortunate enough to fall off of them. Oftentimes the bridges could be broken or have holes for those not paying enough attention to fall to their deaths. This map would be by far one of the largest in the game, far outscaling burrows and the, the tight alleys of streets. The Geshef and his factory would be moved to the surface, which gave you a cool peek out over the landscape. It makes sense when you consider you're supposed to be exporting across the continent. As you make your way throughout the fort, it really succeeded in giving the feeling of being an organic, lived-in place, something that many of the previous maps failed to achieve. It feels like many of the cornerstone businesses have been here centuries, and that these bridges have been hastily erected over time in order to accommodate a growing populace, one that was not prepared for the magnitude of changes that would strike Evergreen. In many ways, the caves were dumbed down again and made quite easy to survive. The route to the fort was easy to navigate and it often led to frequent screamer incursions and migrant tomfoolery. In November of 2022, Randy would open up the game in a major way, taking open applications for access to the game for the first time in many, many years. This led to an enormous glut of new players, many of whom, again, found themselves banned or failed to fully understand the game. However, for those that remained, it offered a rare entrance into the game if you did not already have a connection inside. For many, fragile bridges would surely be the last, with Scorcher on the horizon. But to much surprise, we would be given the 10th map in May of 2023, Divided Citadel. Divided Citadel in many ways would be one of the most original maps yet. It would move the Incarnate's Gate back to the keep, no longer making him border control for the whole fort, but exclusively the keep. This also meant that there was little keeping the village from the caves, and migrants could now be expected to be found mingling amongst those lucky enough to already reside in the fort itself. This map would be the first to make good use of the mercenary donation role, giving the pusher the ability to summon them to his hideout whenever someone wished to purchase their services. They could also be used as additional muscle to keep order amongst the smurds when the Cerberi either did not care or did not have the capability to enforce the Baron's will. Divided Citadel is running at this very moment and I hope that those of you who have taken a break will return to check it out. It's a really well crafted map and has reignited my interest in the game once again. If you made it this far through all of my rambling, thank you for listening. I'm certain I got a few things wrong here and there. Be sure to correct me below. Thank you to all the many players in the hideout who helped me make this video, especially Randy, Hydrated, Persona, Nire, Bonecat, Fizzbun, Logius, Edorix, Grifferman, and many others who offered up corrections, videos, and screenshots to guide me along the way. This video is made with genuine love for the game, and I hope it can serve as a long-running source of knowledge for players both old and new. If you haven't tried LifeWeb yet, be sure to hop in the hideout discord. I'll put a link below and you can try your luck at getting in through a sponsor, maybe even another wave in November. I'll see you all in ISFET later this year. Have a good one.